Okay, I guess it's live now, so. So let's get started. I think the plan today is finishing, hopefully, what we have been looking at uh, in the past two weeks. But before we start, uh, has everyone received their assignments, paper assignments? Let's say it again. Oh, where can you see those? Uh, Mohammed, can you see the assignment? Can people see their assignments right now? Yes, it's public online. I just send the link in the chat box. I'll send the message right now. Okay. Yeah, it's in the chat box, but if you're not on Zoom, probably you will not see the chat box. Yeah, it's, it should be online on the website, I think. But maybe the email is not sent yet. Yeah, we tried uh, to assign the paper you chose uh, to you, but in some cases, we, uh, we assign paper, the paper that's like next in your list. Uh, so let us know. Uh, I think, did you decide which paper? Okay, okay, good. So there were some cases where whenever we did that, we asked people and uh, I think once you decide, let us know. And uh, anything else, Mohammed? Like when do the presentation start? Maybe you should. Uh, we should that... start it on April 7 or on end of March. Okay. Okay, April 7th or end of March? Both are possible? Uh, end of March would be best because we have single presentation the last day, which is 2nd of June. So if we can merge it with another day, then we can have it 7th of April. Okay, okay. So maybe I'll ask people, do you prefer the presentations to start on April 7th and have one day where you have three presentations? Or do you prefer the presentations to start on March uh, 31st, a bit earlier, which means that people who will present first will get only two weeks or so and have one day where there's only one presentation. Anybody? Who, who votes for starting early? Who votes for starting late? I think really the starting late people win. It's a five to four. Okay. I think it's better for people who present early if we start late. What do you think? Order yeah, order is, uh, I don't know if the order is determined yet. Probably not. Is it determined, Mohammed? Uh, not yet, but it, it will be close to what we have online. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. It's still tentative. Uh, people on Zoom um, voting for April 7. Okay. Yeah, I don't look at the Zoom voters, but... Okay, then April 7th wins, which means that we don't have any student presentations, at least until uh, April 7th, which gives you, now you know the papers, you can start preparing right away, uh, which gives you at least three weeks, to every, everyone at least three weeks to prepare, which I think is pretty good. Okay, let's do that then. I mean, the downside is there will be one session with three presentations, but hopefully it's not... We had that last year also because of, not because of scheduling, but because someone was sick and they had to be scheduled to some other day. Yes, please. Oh, okay. So you don't know where it, that, I think he, uh, Mohammed, can you actually uh, send the link on the, uh, via Moodle? Yeah, I'm on it. I'm writing the message right now. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe also copy uh, somebody copy and paste the chat message Mohammed sent again to Zoom so that you can receive it. Yeah, whenever you join Zoom, you don't see the past chats, right? That's there should be a feature that's available to everyone, right? Who, regardless of whenever they join. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else related to this? So let us know, for example, if you, uh, well, I guess two things. If you, I, I hope you're happy with the assignments, first of all, uh, since most of you got what you really wanted. Uh, and if not, you got the second best you really wanted, but there may be reasons why the second best could be good for a presentation and uh, compared to everything else that's presented in the, um, 
in the coming sessions. Uh, but again, we're flexible. We can change it to first best if you prefer your first best, first best, first rank paper, for example. And the second thing is presentation date. So, okay, yeah, if you have, for example, some constraints on the dates, let us know as soon as you can, the sooner the better, so that we can plan. Okay, any other questions on logistics? Maybe we can cover what makes a good presentation, like in the next sessions. We still have two or three sessions. Yes, please. Yes, yes. So there will be, you should meet with your mentors at least twice. And I think people actually like that. So we're going to assign the mentors also. They're not assigned yet. We just need to wet the list. So in some cases, for example, we assigned uh, papers. Uh, so for some people who were assigned the second choice, they were assigned because there's a mentor who's a co-author of the paper who can basically mentor much better, right? If you actually work with a co-author of a paper, then you get a deeper insight into the paper that you may not otherwise get. Right? That's one of the rationales for assigning uh, papers that may not be the first ranked paper on your, on your list, for example. Okay, anything else? Okay, so maybe, uh, maybe we should jump into where we were uh, in this. Okay, we need to, now you're seeing exactly what I'm seeing. That's also good. So we were talking about processing in memory. And frankly, I don't remember exactly where we stopped. So you'll have to remind me. I think we were somewhere uh, at Ambit, right? Does anybody remember? The bulk bitwise operations? Yes. And we then continue further. Uh, that's right. Yes, we got. <laughs> We got off the slides basically at that point, and we were talking about the review process. Do we want to talk more about the review process right now, or should we continue the in memory computation part? In memory computation part? Okay, so let's continue then. So, yes, uh, okay, I think uh, now I remember better. We were talking about these papers basically and the uh, review process associated with it. And hopefully that was useful. We may talk about it again because we're going to cover some papers that are assigned. Uh, we may talk about Rohammer reviews, for example. I can give you an insider about that when we cover the Rohammer paper, if you remind me when we covered, because somebody selected the Rohammer, original Rohammer paper also. And uh, I can give you an in insider's view of the review process over there. It was rejected once, basically. And the rejection arguments are quite interesting. Uh, okay, uh, but let's not derail right now. Okay, so these are the papers uh, that we discussed. I don't think we discussed SIMDRAM last time, did we? Okay, yeah, I think we really stopped right here, actually. So uh, clearly, Ambit, uh, this sort of bulk bitwise operation is very interesting. Uh, and uh, what, what, there, there are some downsides to Ambit, or at least uh, uh, making, making this sort of execution model usable requires some more effort. And this was the paper that we published last year in the ASPOS conference that talks about how to make this more general and let's say more programmer friendly by solving some of the issues. And I'll give you the key ideas. I'm not sure if this paper is going to be presented. I don't remember actually, but you probably have the list right now that I don't have access to. But the uh, basic idea here is to have an end-to-end -end processing in using DRAM framework that provides a programming interface, uh, instruction set architecture and hardware support for efficiently computing complex operations in DRAM. It's not just not, and, or, and majority, but even more complicated operations you can specify using a function of these uh, bitwise, uh, triple row activation basically, and or uh, consecutive row activation. And uh, if the programmer needs an arbitrary operation, they can also specify that uh, with this framework, which is I think powerful and important. So they don't need to go to the uh, abstraction level of and or not basically, they can specify some more complicated operation that makes use of the and or not majority primitives. And then they can use that operation in the ISA as a uh, instruction for example, and with minimal change to the DRM architecture beyond what Ambit does, uh, this block bitwise triple activation does. And this is basically the overview of the flow. Uh, the idea is to have the user specify some desired operation using maybe this sort of gates. This could potentially be higher level also, and then gets compiled into gates, right? With some tools. 
And then it gets translated into majority and not. So if you think about and or not, uh, clearly this is functionally complete, but majority and not is also functionally complete. And there are works that show that majority and not can be quite efficient in terms of representing uh, operations overall. And then uh, basically any complex operation or desired complex operation can be implemented as a sequence of DRM commands. Uh, activate pre-charge, activate pre-charge, basically triple or activate as well as row clone operations. And that's the idea. This is called a micro program that implements the desired operation. And this micro program gets stored uh, with the system. And at some point it gets downloaded to the memory, memory controller. And the memory controller with each uh, block bitwise operation has a micro program associated with it. And the user essentially simply calls an instruction in the program to execute an operation. Clearly, I'm giving you the high level over here. There's also data mapping and data transposition uh, that also needs to happen. And the paper discusses those uh, issues as well. But from a, pro a user's perspective, programmer's perspective, you just call this new operation, which gets sent to the memory controller and the memory controller executes this micro program uh, and provides the result. So this abstraction is clearly much simpler, right? You just specify instructions, and then uh, those instructions get executed in the memory controller using preloaded microprograms. And you can potentially change the microprograms as your system uh, executes. Okay. Oh. oh, okay, yes. Yeah, maybe we can take a quick break. Uh, so I think this uh, is not working for some reason. Let me see. Yeah, we right now select MacBook Air, but if we go to... Uh, majority not operation, it's, it's analog basically what we discussed. Uh, so it, the triple row activation is uh, the analog portion and the not is also analog, right? Yes. And maybe I can answer related questions. I don't know if people can still hear it <laughs> on Zoom at least. Yeah, maybe I can still keep going. You can, you can see these slides at least, right? Or maybe not the video. I'll keep the video also, why not? Right? Yeah, I'll keep going if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so basically, uh, I mean, this SIMD RAM paper discussed a lot of other issues like data transposition, right? Uh, uh, if you if you really want to do these bit serial operate. Uh,
I'll continue with my speakers. <laughs> so when you're ready, let me know. Okay, I'll, I'll go back to these slides. Uh, but basically it's bit serial, right? So for example, if, if you're operating, if your data elements are one bit wide, this, perfect, this fits perfectly. But if your data elements are four bits wide, then you need to do some tricks, right? Uh, and the paper discussed a lot of interesting issues related to that sort of vertical data layouts and how things en get enabled. And I think this is fascinating how they enable uh, a model like this, uh, but maybe I will not talk more detail in more detail about it because you can clearly read the paper or watch presentations related to this, unless you want to go into more detail. We have more to cover. Oh, no, this no, is not okay. it. No. Okay. Oh, oh. oh, okay, it's working, you're right. Okay, I think you did some magic. Can you, can you start to go and go to set? Okay. Go menu. Okay, like this. Okay, settings. settings. Okay. And test the speed. Okay, there you go. Microphone is working, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's great. And okay. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay, thank you. So you had to do something inside the, then. The, the, uh, guys. Okay, guys. yes. Okay, yeah, so if this happens again, we'll call you again because we yeah, cannot sure. fix it in some other way. Sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So now we have uh, the microphone and speaker. So people on Zoom can hear us, right? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry about this. I think this may be a function of the room and not anything else, because I don't have I don't have this issue in the other room that I normally teach at. It just happens here, and it happens inconsistently. Like last week, it didn't happen. Not the previous week, it happened. Uh, okay. Uh, any uh, so basically, uh, uh, this is an easier uh, to program engine for block bitwise operations that solves some system level issues also in uh, block bitwise operation. And you can see the results are actually quite uh, promising, uh, but the ambit results were also quite promising. Uh, but there are more comparisons over here in this paper to a high-end GPU, for example. And uh, if you want to look at the primitives, uh, primitive operations, yeah, unfortunately, uh, people on Zoom maybe will not be able to see it. Uh, maybe I can share it, let's see. If I do a new share, if I share this, Okay, now people on Zoom can also see it, right? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, so if you look at the paper over here, there's a lot of analysis on, uh, for example, uh, the bit width of operations, like 16 different operations and the scaling of operations in terms of uh, the bit width uh, that you use. If the element size is 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, or 64 bits, some operations scale nicely, some operations scale really badly. Uh, like division and multiplication, for example, scale uh, really badly, meaning they're very difficult to implement on this bit serial substrate. Uh, but like absolute addition, bit count, they scale reasonably. That's what the linear class means. And logarithmic means these uh, reduction operations, actually, they scale not as well as linear, but I guess much better than quadratic. So basically, because it's a bit serial substrate, as the element size increases, uh, the performance of an operation goes down, right? Uh, because you need to operate on many bits at the same time. And also the different uh, triple row activation as well as row clone operations. And uh, if, if it's very complicated, like division and multiplication, it's not a good fit uh, for this sort of substrate. Does that make sense? Because we're operating in a bitwise manner. Everything is concurrent in a bitwise manner. Okay, uh, so this is one example. And you can see, uh, there's more analysis on real world kernels, like near, K nearest neighbor search, some neural networks, uh, and the bit weaving database that Ambit also examined. Uh, and the results are quite uh, promising still. Okay, I think we can go back to the old chair, unless there are questions. Where were we? Any questions? Okay. So uh, I think there is more work to be done in this area also, if people are interested in research. Uh, certainly this sort of bulk bitwise execution substrates are just starting, in my opinion. There, there are only very few papers in this area, whereas in, in general processing in memory, there are actually a lot more papers. Uh, I think this substrates can be optimized even more going into the future. 
this is something I will not cover a lot, but uh, using the analog operational properties of uh, the device, the uh, DRAM in this case, you can also uh, generate physical unclonable functions like fingerprints of the device. You can recognize the device uh, based on the uh, unique analog characteristics of the device. This could be good, good for att attestation, for example. DRAM can be used as a way of attesting. You're really talking to the uh, device that you have validated uh, in the past. If someone basically changes the device and tries to uh, have an attack on you, uh, you will be able to detect it uh, because every DRAM device has a unique, let's say, uh, analog signature. Uh, and the way uh, it's exploited in this is, uh, the way these uh, physical unclonable functions are generated is when you reduce the latency uh, to a level, uh, uh, so, some cells always fail, some cells never fail, some cells fail randomly. Uh, if you have a signature of those cells that always fail, if you select the cells such that you have a signature of those cells that always fail, these are unique across different DRAM devices because of uh, the process variation. And they're also consistent. They always fail every time you change the latency to this value. So that's essentially a unique signature, right? That's how we can do a testation, for example. I think this is fascinating. But of course, the similar insight, the fact that some cells randomly fail, uh, meaning 50% there are one, 50% there are zero when you reduce the latency to a level, uh, also says that you can actually generate two random numbers as well. Uh, this is because, of, because it's a physical process, uh, um, we believe it's two random numbers. Uh, as a result, basically, we're identifying these cells that fail randomly. And whenever you access those cells with the specified latency that enables them to fail randomly, you get a random bit, zero or one. There's no way to figure out what you would get. Of course, you need to select those cells that fail randomly to begin with. You, have a, you need to have a profiling process uh, for the DRAM chip. And I think this is also fascinating. You can generate random numbers using DRAM. I think we have a paper that's going to be presented. I believe that's selected. Maybe you can confirm or deny that, but uh, which is this paper, uh, this Otterbach's paper, he's sitting over there. Uh, so he'll go, he's probably going to be one of the mentors. Is it selected? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is another paper that provides a different way of actually uh, generating those random numbers. Here, uh, we're exploiting the fact that when you reduce latency, some cells fail randomly. Uh, here, uh, we're exploiting the fact that when you activate four rows concurrently, uh, you get randomness uh, in the sense amplifier results, basically. So these are different physical phenomena. Uh, they may eventually, uh, at some point, they may actually be similar at the lower levels, levels of the device, but we don't know exactly, of course. Okay, and I think this is fascinating, basically. You can generate random numbers. And I think this sort of thing is actually very useful if you uh, are implementing other functionality in DRAM as well, right, in memory. So if you, for example, want to, uh, I don't know, implement uh, some encryption engine in DRAM, randomness that you, get out of DRAM could be good because you don't need to build some more additional circuit to generate random numbers. And there's another paper that comes up, uh, coming up actually at HPCA where we look at the end-to-end -end system design to make this work more efficiently. Yes. Okay, we want to take that? Yeah, maybe you can ask that question again <laughs> when the paper is presented. So I guess Zoom people did not hear Atabark's answer. Hello, Zoom people. Zoom people can hear me or no? Maybe we lost them at some point. I guess they, hello, okay. So did you hear, okay. No, we did not, okay, sorry. So we need to find a solution to this. 
If you speak using this, can people hear you? I guess. Right? Maybe when people ask questions, we need to pass this. Hello? I think I'm... Zoom people can hear this, right? Can they? Okay. Okay, okay. good. Okay. Okay, so the question was, uh, how do we make sure that, or how does quadruple activation result in random values in uh, DRAM? And the answer is basically, our hypothesis is that when we initialize these cells that are activated at the same time with values such that they are uh, conflicting each other, uh, they will, each one of those values, uh, cells will uh, share their um, charge with the bit line and the bit line voltage will, Remain, remain below a reliable sensing threshold. And then the sense amplifier will try to amplify that, but it will fail to do it reliably. And then we end up with either ones or zeros depending on other uh, factors like process variation and temperature and all other things that we investigate in the paper. And you can maybe take a look yeah. for more details. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Now I now figured I out how work. this works, but for this to work, we really need to make the system work. And I think we need that for future presentations if we want people to participate hybridly. Okay, so clearly there's a lot more research going on in this two random number generation. And I think it's, I find this fascinating. People have found similar results with other memory technologies as well. Uh, but the good thing with DRAM is this is real. This, this happens in real chips, basically. Yeah, all of these papers show that uh, in off the shelf DRAM chips, you get these random numbers. Whereas emerging technologies, Usually you don't have the luxury uh, to have access to those real chips. Uh, so you need to simulate and argue that, okay, you'll get a random number because of process variation usually. <laughs> Go ahead, yes. I don't know, maybe when I speak, it's muted. Maybe you need to tap on it. And now Zoom can hear me. Yes, I think, well, if we can hear you, I think they can hear you also. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. need to click yeah. that button. Okay. Okay, any questions on this? So of course, I think there's is, there is another direction with processing using memory, what other operations can be supported, right? Uh, by using the analog operational properties of DRAM or other, uh, other types of memory. And I think that's also a very interesting research. Let's go to processing near memory. This is, let's say a bit more conventional, right? Uh, this enables uh, processors to get closer to uh, the memory device or inside the memory device. Uh, and I think this is certainly interesting. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of work in this area. You'll find them in many of the reference papers also, and certainly in the, uh, the primary paper that I mentioned earlier, uh, we try to reference all, as far as we know, all of the, uh, all of the, let's say, interesting papers that are out in the field. I'll give you some examples from our own work, since I know our own work the best, right? Uh, and I think it's very interesting. Uh, so what, one example work is uh, when we first started looking in this area, we were very interested in graph analytics. We're still interested in graph analytics, I think. But when you think about uh, 3D stacked memory uh, or uh, processing near memory, then the question always becomes what applications should you find to demonstrate the value of a system like that, right? And graph processing is clearly important. And this is, you can see that these numbers are old numbers. Like I think Facebook right now has doubled the number of users. Uh, I don't know why, but they somehow seem to still keep getting users. Uh, amazing, right? <laughs> uh, and I mean, clearly Wikipedia has been extremely useful, but uh, there are many other uh, workloads that actually benefit uh, from graph representations and graph processing, like bioinformatics actually, there, 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 there are representations of genomes using graphs and you operate on graphs. That's one example, machine learning. Some of the machine learning frameworks are based on graph representations, graph neural networks, are one example. So graph processing is actually very interesting with this graph representation of things in general and processing on, this, on that graph representation is very interesting. But uh, scalable large scale graph processing is actually very challenging. This is some uh, data that we have in this paper that shows that on five important workloads, graph algorithms, uh, you, you get very little speed up if you quadruple the number of cores. So 40% speed up is very little if you quadruple the number of cores, right? Uh, it's, yeah. Uh, and the reason is uh, essentially uh, a lot of the graph algorithms have a lot of random memory accesses, not all mem random memory accesses, but a significant fraction of random memory accesses. 
and little amount of computation to perform. So they're memory bottlenecked in the end. Uh, and as a result, I, uh, these are a good fit for, uh, at least the graph algorithms that are bottlenecked by memory are a good fit for uh, near data processing or near memory processing. This could be near storage also, actually. We look at near memory aspects because a lot of graph uh, analytics engines are in memory graph analytics engines. People, what they try to do is as much as possible, they try to keep, stay within memory because going to storage is very costly, right? If possible, they try to, they design their uh, graph analytics engine to stay within memory. They may need large amounts of memory, huge amounts of memory, but they partition the graph on lots of machines so that they don't need to go to the storage as much as possible. Now this is, of course, sometimes storage becomes a bottleneck also uh, if they have to go to the storage. So that's why I said near storage processing could be also useful uh, potentially. Uh, but we looked at near memory processing. And in this particular case, we looked at these 3D stacked memory plus logic engines that we have looked at earlier. Essentially, these are 3D te integration technologies where you have a logic layer underneath many memory layers. And the logic layer and memory layers are connected via very dense interconnects, uh, many of them high bandwidth interconnects, low latency, low energy, or reason, much lower energy than basically interconnects between a processor and two dies, essentially. Uh, so there's a lot of bandwidth, memory bandwidth available to this logic layer. And uh, this is actually a very interesting research direction. Uh, how, how can you do integration better? Uh, can you actually have much uh, more densely integrated? So one of the issues with this sort of integration is uh, these, these are called two silicon vias. And because they have to be wide, very wide, uh, uh, they, you cannot have really many, many of them. It's certainly much more than the interconnects between two dies today, uh, because uh, you're really uh, putting multiple dies together, stacking them and bonding them uh, using these true silicon vias. Uh, but uh, there are other technologies that are under development that are more monolithic. These are called monolithic 3D. Uh, they don't use this sort of true silicon vias. They actually use much more natural, smaller interlayer vias. And, Again, this is based on fabrication technology. They may use other materials like graphene, for example, uh, and they're under development uh, for sure. And if, if those actually are successful, then you can potentially have uh, much higher bandwidth between logic and memory. And also you get the additional benefit of intermixing logic and memory. Of course, with any uh, system that looks like this, you always have thermal issues, right? Because you have some computation, and then heat gets generated, where does heat escape, right? You always have that problem in these 3D systems as well as going forward in monolithic 3D systems. I need to think about how to cool it. Right? Okay, so, but this is a good fit for processing near data because this, if you put logic uh, processing elements inside the logic layer over here, they have very high bandwidth and low latency and low energy access uh, to the memory layers on top, right? Okay, and that's what we did basically in this work. Of course, the question is how you do it and how do you design the system uh, to make it work? Uh, and this is again, simulation system because uh, we, we don't have access to, well, we didn't have access to these devices at that time, but simulation is always a good start to show benefits. I'll give you the high level idea, but the paper is actually a lot more uh, detailed. I don't think we're gonna see this paper. I don't know if we're gonna see related papers, but essentially uh, the idea is to have an interconnected set of 3D stack memory plus logic chips with simple cores inside. So logic layer has many cores, processing cores. And you can see that each core, uh, each tile in a logic layer hosts a core and a memory controller, and then some prefetching engines and a message queue. These message queues enable message passing between the cores. So this is program using message passing. And there's some interconnection network that connects these cores. And basically on top of each core, you have memory assigned to that core that's called a vault in this 3D stack memory terminology. And uh, the core can modify the memory on top of it. And if it needs to modify some other memory, uh, it needs to send a message to the core that essentially hosts that memory on top of it. So basically the goal is to not move the data. The goal is to move the functions to the data. Uh, that's the idea. That's how you can reduce the data moment. And moving functions is usually less than moving data in general. Uh, especially if you partition your graph nicely. Uh, that, that becomes important and the paper discusses that certainly. Uh, so that's the idea basically. If you, uh, if the course communicate with each other through a network and messaging mechanisms, and whenever you need to update some graph node, you send a message to the core that houses that node 
and that does the update. Of course, you need to send the intermediate value also if that updates requires an intermediate value, right? Uh, so that's the idea. So you don't basically aggregate all of the values in a central CPU as we do today, right? Today, we aggregate all of the values in a central CPU. And if things are all random access, then you have to actually, well, maybe all is too strong, but if you have random accesses, you don't get good locality in the CPU caches also. Whereas here, hopefully you do some partitioning to get good locality with here as well as in each uh, vault. And uh, whenever you do an update to a random location, that update happens in place where that random location is stored, that data doesn't get moved anywhere else. That's the idea. Okay, so of course there are issues related to it, right? Uh, this, so uh, if you want to send a message within the logic layer, that's easy, not bad. But if you really want to update a graph node that's far away, meaning in some other uh, cube, this is also called a cube, then you need to go off chip. So that's similar to existing systems in a sense. Uh, so the idea here is to, the goal here is to minimize these off chip accesses and maximize the on chip accesses as much as possible. And that brings us to the graph partitioning that I mentioned. If you really want to do this well, you need to somehow partition your graph nicely so that you minimize the accesses uh, that happen across the chips, chip boundaries. And there's actually, this is old work right now. It's, it was published in 2015. There are later works that tackle that issue, for example, if you partition your graphs better, if you do the load balancing better across cores, you can actually get much better results than this work demonstrated in 2015. And if you think about uh, uh, the system level perspective, you can think about this as a, a graph uh, analytics accelerator, right? You, you have some graph engine that's running, a uh, graph analytics engine. You offload it completely to this accelerator and that accelerator uh, is physically addressed meaning there's no virtual memory in it. There's no cache coherence in it. Uh, it's programmed using message passing uh, and uh, it's non-cacheable. Basically you don't cache uh, things in the host processor while the accelerator is running. That's the idea. Uh, it, you can, uh, if you think about the evolution of GPUs, this looks like a very primitive GPU about 25 years ago. Right? It's a very primitive GPU that the enthusiasts were using for computation. You see some early works in 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, where people are using GPUs for computation. Uh, today, a lot of people are clearly using GPUs for computation, but GPUs also evolved a lot uh, to become more programmable. But this is kind of like that, in my opinion. It doesn't provide a lot of support for programmability. Uh, and you need to know what you're doing basically to take advantage of it really well. That's somewhat true of GPUs still, but maybe less true than 20 years ago. Uh, probably this will also, this sort of thing will also evolve uh, to incorporate other things like virtual memory potentially, right? That's the idea going forward. But this is an early demonstration that an important application can benefit from these interconnected set of 3D stack memory plus logic chips with simple cores and message passing. Okay, so that's the high level overview of the paper. Yes, please. I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, yeah, that's a very good catch. This figure is not representative of what we actually implemented. It's really a cross-bar network in the end, which is actually quite expensive. But uh, I think you have a good point. And uh, if you if you want to have a network that's cheaper over here you run into some trade-offs, basically communication trade-offs. And that's always true when you have networks. But yes, this, this is not what we implemented. Basically there's no asymmetry like this in this network. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say it's, it's really access patterns. Like uh, whenever you do at least uh, many of the graph algorithms, you get these random accesses and random accesses are terrible at today's memory, main memory hierarchies uh, because the caches don't work, right? In most cases, uh, I would say that. And that little amount of computation that you do in many of the algorithms. 
I would say locality yes, in this particular case, yes. That's a good point, certainly. There is some locality still, but that's why this in-order core has some caches, but it's not the huge cache hierarchy. Basically, I think AMD is going to announce some cache that's, I don't know how big, it, how big is it going to be soon? Has anybody heard? It's going to be, I don't know, 32 or 64 gigabytes, or, or basically it's a 3D stack cache. It's actually, there are some similarities. They're going to have a CPU and a cache on top of it. It's 32 or 64, maybe 96. Don't quote me on it. It's at least 32. That 32 gigabyte cache is mostly useless, I would say. You're wasting a lot of space for, for random access applications. Okay, yeah, yeah megabyte is better, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's megabyte still. Megabyte is a lot of wasted, yes. Yeah, sorry. I'm used to main memory thinking about in gigabytes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, go ahead. Or should I uh, look at it here or? Yeah. Ah. Let's see. Is processing on graphs well parallelizable since all cores work on the same graph? Is coherence also a limiting factor? Yeah, that's a good question, basically. Uh, I think it really depends on the graph algorithm. Yes, there's certainly some parallelization, but again, it doesn't necessarily eliminate the random accesses because parallelization is different from locality, uh, but certainly there, it's, it's parallelizable. But yes, there are coherence issues also, and that's where programming this becomes challenging, right? Because this message passing maze, it doesn't provide you any shared memory coherence substrate. Uh, you really need to pass, pass messages uh, to uh, keep states uh, that are, let's say, shared uh, or share uh, values. So that's a very good question. And the second question is, is the partitioning of the graph uh, depend on the application? Yes, absolutely, basically. How you partition it really depends on the access pattern also, right? Uh, if, you're, if your access patterns have, uh, usually graph partitioning uh, takes advantage of the locality structures, right? I, I, even though I said random access, not everything is completely random, right? In these graph accesses, there's enough randomness that makes it, makes existing, uh, uh, let's say memory hierarchies terrible at executing graphs in general. Uh, but yes, different applications also are different because there are many, many graph algorithms that people do. There are many different things that people do on graphs. Uh, as a result, the partitioning also is very much dependent on uh, uh, the algorithms that you employ, as well as the data sets. So there's certainly a graph partitioning area that, uh, uh, that tries to maximize these locality, find, this, find, find these locality clusters that's independent of this work. We use in this work, for example, a tool, it's called Metis, that does graph partitioning. And we evaluated the effectiveness of that tool uh, on uh, this system, for example. And that tool doesn't, didn't necessarily provide the better results compared to the graph partitioning that we used, for example. In, in some cases it did, but in some cases it didn't because it wasn't necessarily considering the uh, trade-offs that you see in the system. Right? Okay, maybe we didn't do a good job of, uh, like, like a perfect job of uh, adapting that tool to the system also, right? You could also argue it that way. Okay, so it's good that there are a lot of questions over here. Uh, I'll skip this. So there's a lot of, uh, there's another thing over here that's interesting, I think. So there's so much bandwidth that's available to these cores, uh, each core that uh, just using regular accesses is not enough to saturate the bandwidth or make, take advantage of the bandwidth. So we actually have sophisticated prefetching mechanisms uh, to take advantage of the uh, structure of the communication. For example, we have message triggered prefetching. You receive a message, uh, you may not process it immediately because there's some queuing delay. You start prefetching the data that is required by the message because message contains information about what data is needed as well. And then there's a locality-based prefetching to take advantage of the locality in the graphs. Okay. Okay, so let's go into results. There's a lot more detail in the paper that I don't want to spend time on, but feel free to ask questions. Uh, so the key results here, I guess I can, maybe I can remove this. So these are the systems that we compared to at the time. Uh, this is a DDR3-based system. You can see uh, all of these systems have the processor and memory dichotomy. Processor is separate from the memory. Uh, and DDR3 has much lower bandwidth that's available to these processors. Uh, HMC hybrid memory cube, that was the th state-of-the-art 3D stacked memory technology at the time. Uh, but you could use it. So even though there's a logic layer here and memory here, you could use it as regular memory, right? You could basically uh, connected with links to the CPU. As a result, you get also higher bandwidth. Basically, this was high bandwidth memory because of the way it was designed. 
Like, and you can see that it gets 640 gigabytes per second. And this is a different system, 512 in order course to make fair comparisons with what we have. And this is a Tesseract system. And you can see that it's different because processing and memory are not really separate, right? It's, they're really combined in this 3D uh, cube, if you will. And uh, this is the uh, bandwidth that is available to all, all those 32 Tesseract cores, which is equivalent to, I think, uh, 512 uh, in order course, because each of these has 16 of these in order course inside. So the bandwidth that you get is a lot, actually. It's more than an order of magnitude compared to the best prior system because of the, because you're putting the cores directly inside the logic layer. Okay, and this is the performance you get. This is end-to-end -end performance on five graph processing algorithms. And you can see that the final uh, design is about 13 to 14 X improvement compared to DDR3 auto order processors. Uh, on graph processing algorithms. And you can see that uh, like just, just increasing the bandwidth in the processors doesn't help you uh, a lot, even though it helps you 56%, which is not bad still. Uh, it's really, the benefits are really coming from both the bandwidth increase and the processing inside the memory as well as the programming model changes. So there's a complex interaction and the paper tries to analyze that a little bit as well, yes. Maybe that's a good idea, yes. <laughs> Uh, are, are there any limitations to what we can fit in the logic layer of one of these hybrid memory cubes? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because you, you don't have uh, a lot of logic. We analyze that uh, partially in this paper and partially in the next paper, one of the next papers that I will discuss. Uh, basically, you're limited in terms of area because there should be other things in that uh, logic layer as well. The memory controller, for example, uh, and also the interfaces to the higher layers. Uh, and the TSVs, for example, they occupy space. So yes, there are certain limitations. So it's not infinite. Yeah. And the analysis in, the, in, in this paper, there's some analysis, but there's a stronger analysis in our S plus 2018 paper. Uh, that's something that I will so, I'll show you soon. It's a Google workloads paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't put, for example, very sophisticated out of order course. There are multiple reasons for it. One is, First of all, you don't necessarily need them for this sort of workload. Second is they occupy a lot of space. And the third is uh, they consume a lot of power. And power is a big problem over here because you have 3D stacking and uh, you don't wanna consume unnecessary power because that leads to thermal issues. Okay. And this is the energy reduction in this paper. You can take a look. Energy reduction is always difficult to evaluate, but. The good thing is, I think uh, this paper is old enough that there are a lot of papers that built on it and that improved it, uh, that improved various aspects of it. So I think some of the recent papers showed that the overall performance improvement can be close to two orders of magnitude, maybe even higher. And the overall energy reduction can also be closer to two orders of magnitude, like 100x or so. In, our paper was one of the first uh, to show promising results, but later work actually builds on it and uh, makes it better, which is, I think, a great thing. And 100x is a good number, clearly, right? But of course, to get the 100x now, you're changing everything in the system. Programming model, uh, coherence, virtual memory. Yeah, you're getting rid of a lot of things that we are used to. But again, think of this like a primitive GPU as opposed to a CPU evolving. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, basically, you model uh, how much uh, you model the different events that happen uh, and you multiply the event counts with the amount of energy each event spends and you assume some uh, energy based on the technology, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, because this is simulated, we cannot have physical measurements, but uh, some of the numbers that go into the model are physically measured and validated, but not all of them can be, right? Uh, because uh, I guess a lot of them can be, but not all of them can be because uh, we didn't build a system in the end. That's why energy measurements are always not easy. No, no, we did not build. We did not build. Yes, exactly. So some of the numbers are from simulation, but some of the numbers, especially for baselines, right? You can get numbers from real, validate the numbers from real systems. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's the paper, so you can take a look at it. 
there, there, there's more recent work, actually. Uh, I like this one. This is graph pattern mining in memory. I think this also we're going to discuss probably, if I remember correctly. Okay, you, you selected it. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> maybe you can. I don't want to like spoil it, but I think this is also a very nice way of looking at it. And this doesn't just consider processing near memory, but also considers processing using memory. And it's it's a more set-centric representation. This, this also nicely fits something like Ambit, for example, because Ambit, uh, Ambit really shows that uh, you can do set operations. In fact, I didn't cover that, but Ambit paper spent some time in set operations, union, intersection. These are actually nice bitwise operations as well. And if you express your graph, uh, algorithms, in particular graph mining, graph pattern mining in this case, uh, you can uh, also get a lot of benefit from processing uh, using memory and processing near memory as well. But again, we'll cover it, so let's not spoil it. Okay, so basically I think the takeaway is there's a lot to do in uh, graph analytics uh, and making it more efficient. Uh, and certainly memory bottleneck is big over there. There's, a, there's also a set of work that, uh, looks at accelerators. So FPGAs, for example, there's a lot of work on FPGA-based acceleration of graph uh, algorithms. And that's also very interesting, clearly. OK, any questions? I'm just giving you some examples of each like memory. And you can say that, OK, this is very, uh, let's say, intrusive. And that's true. So we also wanted to look at less intrusive ways of modifying the system so that we can take advantage of processing near memory. And this is one work along this direction. We collaborated with Google. I think I mentioned this work, actually. For, to give you one data point. And our goal in this case was to like, make consumer devices more efficient. So we analyzed these four major workloads that a lot of people use clearly. Uh, uh, the web browser, machine learning inference frameworks, video uh, decoder and encoder. And uh, we, uh, the paper has a lot of analysis on energy cost of data movement. And remember that we discussed this already. I think more than 60% of the entire total system energy spent on data movement. And we were surprised to find that also. Uh, but clearly, one potential solution to fix this problem is really moving computation close to data. The challenge is, again, limited area and energy budget in the logic layer, at least. So that's why this paper actually does a more rigorous analysis of uh, the area and energy budget and designs the cores and accelerators so that it can fit within that area and energy budget. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot. Of the, I think this is one of the papers that we may cover, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, and the second key observation in this paper is really what uh, enables, let's say, making this, uh, make taking advantage of processing near memory simple. And the idea is somehow profile your functions and figure out what needs to be offloaded. And uh, the takeaway is that uh, there's a significant fraction of uh, data movement that comes from very simple functions. Uh, and you can design lightweight logic to implement these simple functions in memory, either using low power cores like, like Tesseract did, or very specialized accelerators. So for example, one function is compression. You can design a compression algorithm, a hardware compressor that operates near memory. Right? Decompression is another function. Uh, in, uh, I think I will show you an, uh, another one. Uh, quantization is another function, for example, in uh, inference. Uh, so there, there are a bunch of these functions that are actually relatively simple that can be implemented with very simple accelerators near memory. Uh, another thing that uh, clearly is not considered here, but you can also have FPGAs, uh, reconfigurable logic near memory, because, okay, what if you don't have a function that's implemented? Clearly, you can implement on low power core, but yes, it's inefficient. But if you can directly uh, instantiate the function in hardware in an FPGA, that's, of course, very efficient as well. So I think going forward, it's always good to think about, like, what the substrate uh, of execution near memory should look like. And I certainly like the the FPGA or reconfigurable logic near memory because it enables you to instantiate whatever you want, right? Uh, assuming your programming model supports it, of course. Okay, so the takeaway in this paper in terms of results is that uh, you, we identify these functions in these four key workloads and offload them to processing in memory logic, which is similar to uh, the 3D stack memory logic that we show, uh, saw earlier. And on average, the performance improves by 2.3x and I think performance improves by 2.2x and energy improves by 2.3x, which is not bad, but clearly not the 14x, right? But hopefully this is a lot less effort than completely redoing your application. Here, you just need to look at, figure out which functions can be offloaded. But there are some challenges, of course, like coherence becomes a challenge and virtual memory becomes a challenge as well. We need to provide support for it also. 
Okay, so workload analysis is here. Uh, so if you look at TensorFlow, this is one example workload. Uh, two functions. So uh, at least in the evaluated neural networks doing inference, we found out that more than uh, more than fifty percent of the inference energy is spent on data movement, and more than fifty percent of the data movement energy comes from just two functions: packing and unpacking of the data, so that you prepare the data for the next layer, let's say, in the neural network for processing, and quantization of the data uh, to and I think all neural uh, engines today do a quantization of the data because they don't want to operate on 32-bit huge values, floating point values. They want to operate on small integer values. And that quantization clearly brings a lot of data and you chop off some values based on some quantization strategy that you have, algorithm that you have. Uh, and uh, that also consumes a lot of energy because it does a lot of data movement. So by doing these two operations in memory, near memory, you get uh, a lot of improvements in the end. I think this is fascinating. Of course, this is dependent on the data, right? Meaning what your neural network looks like, uh, what is the baseline neural network is, uh, et cetera. Okay, so this is, uh, this is one other work. And I think this is uh, very interesting also. I think there are more works, but we don't have time to cover them. Uh, if, if people have questions, feel free, yes. Uh, using processing near memory. So I'm not sure because this is a bit forward looking, but certainly they've improved uh, the design of their systems based on the results in this paper. Not necessarily for, from a processing near memory perspective though. The analysis of the workloads in this paper enabled them to improve, for example, their hardware encoder decoder designs to minimize the data movement as much as possible within the current constraints. But processing near memory, at least I haven't seen an announcement from them uh, currently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe i mean uh, i think that, that would be a good uh, distinction they can provide right uh, that would be my guess i don't think there's any reason to because i think you need to expose us to the programmers programming android phones for example right uh, to take advantage of this i mean they can do it transparently without telling anyone of course right that's also possible but with their ecosystem it may be harder <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good question. I think uh, I think research is actually uh, not probably, I mean, there, there needs to be some research, certainly, especially in issues like system level issues, coherence, virtual memory. I'm gonna talk about that. These are some adoption issues. But from uh, what limits implementability, I would say is more the cost right now, I would say. It's because uh, you have a cost, you need to have this sort of memory to enable it. And a lot of these devices uh, don't have memory with that cost. Oh, I guess, sorry. <laughs> we need to get used to this. This is not a classroom. I think he's done this. <laughs> yeah, the question is basically, does you, Google right now use these results? And for the analysis results, yes, but probably not the pressing in memory designs at this point, but mainly because I would say the cost. And, and also cost is not just the cost of memory that you integrate, but also the processes to integrate it into your system, right? Yeah, but uh, as we discussed last time, uh, uh, even uh, major uh, DI manufacturers are moving into processing in memory. So I expect these things will become, let's say, easier to justify from a cost perspective also over time, right? If things continue this way also. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there are other works and uh, people have been looking at uh, having GPUs and offloading GPU computation, especially memory intensive GPU computation to GPUs that are under in the logic layer. This is a distributed GPU system uh, with multiple memory modules, as you can see, but also multiple computation modules. This can be a much smaller GPU that's, uh, that can do simple computation or it has less execution capability, computation capability, but very high amount of memory bandwidth. And this is interesting. There are multiple works that examine this. Uh, Again, we don't have time to cover this, but this is actually an interesting one that we did with NVIDIA, uh, where uh, you not only have this sort of system, but also do, uh, do the offloading transparently, meaning programmer doesn't need to do anything in this particular case. Uh, and I like this approach clearly, but there are downsides to it also, because now the compiler needs to figure out what needs to be offloaded completely. And also there's a runtime system that needs to decide whether offloading really makes sense based on whatever the compiler selected uh, to be offloaded, because you have computation capability that's restricted over here and 
if multiple things need to be offloaded over here, you need to make a decision, right? Uh, whether to offload or which one to offload. Uh, so this is actually, I think, nice, but the results here are uh, the performance improvements, and energy improvements are lower, even lower. They're on the order of 30 to 50%. Because it's completely automated. It assumes an existing GPU program. Nobody modifies it to make it suitable for processing in memory. The compiler goes through it and applies the proposed algorithms to take advantage of the processing near memory GPUs or GPU near memory engines. So there's more work to be done, I think, in this transparent uh, compilation and runtime systems for uh, processing near memory as well. And this is also is another paper that looks at uh, the runtime system for scheduling techniques, but let's not cover that right now. There's more work that looks at linked data structures. This is, I'm, I'm showing you our work, but there, uh, there's also other work that we referenced in the paper. Uh, 3D stack memory, for example, can help these linked data structure traversals. Uh, this paper also tackles the virtual memory problem, which is tough to tackle, I think. How do you basically do translation on the memory site? Uh, that's, that's a thorny issue, I think, because if you really want to uh, do translation, like address translation on the memory side, you need to have structures to enable address translation. And that increases your cost on the memory side significantly. So enabling virtual memory on the memory side may be costly. But maybe we should really be rethinking virtual memory today also, because today we have lots of memory uh, and existing virtual memory manages uh, memory at very small granularity, like four kilobytes. As a result, the structures that are used to manage virtual memory are not scaling very well. So today, for example, you have one terabyte memory. Uh, one terabyte is a large number, right? I think it's two to the 40, right? If I'm not mistaken, correct me if that's not true. Uh, and four kilobyte pages. Okay, let, let me give you eight kilobyte pages. That's relatively large today. Eight kilobyte pages is two to the 13. So two to the 40 divided by two to the 13 is two to the 27, right? That's the size of your number of entries you need to have in your page table. So these page tables have become too complicated in the end. And you have a hierarchy of page tables and page walkers. So this virtual memory subsystem is kind of like a processor within itself, uh, by itself today. Because it can actually access memory and do some small computation and uh, to compute the address and to get the data uh, that's needed to compute the address. So I think it's good to rethink the virtual memory subsystem uh, today going into the future. And I think, uh, uh, processing in memory also has some interaction with rethinking the virtual memory subsystem. I think there were some papers that we proposed for rethinking virtual memory, but I don't think there were any takers or maybe we didn't assign them for some reason. Okay, so actually independent cache is similar to linked data structures, run at execution. So I'm going to just, maybe I'll talk about this one because this is interesting because this is a system where you can actually get real results. Meaning uh, here, uh, you, we already have FPGAs, with high bandwidth memory attached to them. So in a sense, this is kind of similar to what I showed you earlier, logic layer plus uh, hybrid memory cube uh, layers, but FPGAs and high bandwidth memory, not exactly similar because you're not in the logic layer still, but you have a lot of bandwidth. And that's what we uh, did with the IBM folks to take advantage of this memory bandwidth. I'll, I'll mention that in a little bit. And you see significant results actually with these, not just for climate modeling, but also for, uh, genome analysis. Okay, this paper, I think I already mentioned sometime, approximate string matching. And basically there are a lot of demonstrations of processing near memory providing huge benefits. This is another example, time series analysis is used in a lot of data analysis applications in many different scientific fields, economics, uh, astronomy. So they're very interesting applications actually. Here you basically look at a time series data and you try to find some anomalies, for example, in the data. And the data is basically flowing. You keep monitoring, I don't know, stars, and you try to figure out some anomalies that you're looking for. Uh, it could be huge data in the end. And uh, this paper uh, designed some accelerators for that, and uh, the results are actually quite promising if you do it near memory. Okay, this is, I think, uh, somebody selected this paper, so I'm not gonna spoil it, <laughs> uh, which I think is a good idea to cover this paper because this is along the lines of, again, we worked with Google on this. Previously, we had looked at, uh, these four workloads that I mentioned, right? And uh, whether they're, uh, we wanted to understand uh, the bottlenecks of those workloads. Here, we wanted to understand these neural network models that Google uses in their edge devices. Maybe I'll quickly uh, summarize it, but basically we use Google Edge TPU, which is their own uh, Edge TPU device. Uh, it's not the 
training TPU that they use their data centers, but it's the TPU that they use in their uh, mobile devices, for example. And we analyzed 24 Google Edge models. These are proprietary. So unfortunately we cannot release them, but basically we analyzed the issues with the design of the accelerator. And uh, the key takeaway is designing a monolithic accelerator is not good. Uh, and we basically provi provide a framework that can enable heterogeneous acceleration. Uh, and the results show that, and some of these accelerators are actually, uh, if you look at the uh, current accelerator, if you look at TP, it's a systolic array basically, right? And uh, if you want to uh, take advantage of it, today the systolic array is uh, designed as monolithic and it has a lot of memory, uh, a lot for some definition of a lot, right? It's a lot of memory that's unutilized, let's say, underutilized. Uh, and the idea in this paper is that categorize your models, these edge models, such that uh, you can group them into models, uh, layers with different characteristics, neural network layers with different characteristics, and design accelerators that are specialized for different characteristics. That's the idea, as opposed to having a monolithic homogeneous accelerator. And uh, again, we're, we'll, we'll probably discuss this paper, so I don't want to go into a lot of detail right now, but if you do that, then uh, this leads to significant performance energy improvements, as well as it reduces your area because your compute centric accelerator can be much smaller right now. One of the reasons why people over provision the memory in existing accelerators is because uh, they want to capture as much locality as possible. Uh, but if you're memory centric, you don't need that over provisioning because you're very close to memory. Okay, and this is just to uh, showcase what's coming. Let's say we analyze 24 neural network models and they're very different from each other. You can see that these are different. These are a subset of things we analyze. So for example, long short-term memory models are very different from convolutional neural networks in terms of parameter footprint that they have, as well as arithmetic intensity that they have, floating point operations you consume, uh, you, you perform uh, per byte that you fetch from memory. Uh, so this means that basically different Kind of accelerators may be a different, uh, may be a good fit for different models, as well as you have also di diversity within the models. Uh, basically, uh, each layer or different layers have different characteristics, and I think this is actually very, very fascinating. So, Mac intensity is multiply and accumulate operation intensity. Uh, how many multiply and accumulates you do basically, and you can see that the variation is up to 200x between different layers because different layers do different things, right? Some of them do convolution. Some of them do some sort of reduction on the data. Some of them do reorganization of the data, et cetera. Uh, and flop per byte arithmetic intensity also varies a lot. This means that basically one accelerator doesn't fit all. So you should really design multiple accelerators. And that's, the, that's one of the major high level ideas in this work. So you need to really design multiple accelerators, each of them catering to a family of neural networks or layers of neural networks. And of course, uh, how these accelerators are designed are critical how the runtime system is designed is also critical, right? Because these accelerators will receive some neural networks that you need to process and the runtime needs to assign them, uh, uh, assign the appropriate accelerator to the appropriate layer as well as the model. But in the end, the monolithic accelerator is much less efficient and lower performance. And I think on average, we see three X, about three X performance as well as energy improvements by using three accelerators. One of them is compute centric, similar to this, but changed a little bit. And two of them are data centric, meaning they're processing near memory accelerators. And again, I don't want to spoil it because you will see the paper. Uh, and I think this is also very interesting. I, I, I see also this as more specialization uh, as opposed to like further specialization. You don't have a, just an accelerator, but different types of accelerators for different family of neural networks in this particular case. And again, how you implement these accelerators becomes interesting, right? Uh, if you find out some different family, maybe a reconfigurable logic becomes very interesting. Okay. Any questions? Any questions on Zoom or? I don't see anything. Well, I cannot. Okay. Okay. Ah, it opened something else. That's fine. Okay. Uh, let me also mention this uh, paper that I. Uh, like briefly alluded to earlier, maybe two lectures ago. Uh, this is where we look at uh, FPGAs that are coupled with high bandwidth memory and essentially design acceleration logic uh, to accelerate some important applications. 
And one of them is climate modeling. This is the COSMO weather model that's used by many countries in Europe, for example, to do the weather modeling, weather forecasting prediction. And the other is a genome analysis. Here we look at uh, some recent work that we have actually uh, 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 published also. It's called Sneaky Snake. It's a one algorithm uh, that is designed with CPUs, FPGAs, and GPUs in mind. Uh, and I, again, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, otherwise this little lecture will go forever. Uh, but uh, basically here we have a real system because we collaborated with IBM actually to be able to do this. And this is an IBM Power 9 CPU, which is a pretty hefty CPU, let's say. They already have Power 10. Maybe they have Power 11 right now. I don't know, actually. I haven't followed up, but Power 10, they definitely have. Uh, in fact, that was one of the papers that uh, was uh, suggested also uh, uh, the, the analysis of the power 10 architecture in terms of uh, energy efficiency, I think. But I think that that was not selected in the end. Well, that was selected actually, but the, the same person who selected that paper selected uh, another paper as equal priority also. We assigned that other paper. <laughs> Feel free to evaluate the other paper also, but <laughs> they're both, I think, very interesting, certainly. But they're different things, of course. This is a general purpose CPU and the paper you selected was the TPU and the evolution of the TPU or uh, like how I many in four generations, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, this IBM Power 9 CPU has an interface that is nice in the sense that you can offload some computation uh, to an FPGA board that has high bandwidth memory attached to it. And also this interface is pro provides cache coherence. So it's a, it's a very nice interface uh, in that sense. People are developing other interfaces right now, for example, Intel will have the CXL interface, Compute Express Link, that is also a cache coherent, has similar properties. So this sort of interfaces are actually nice uh, because they can enable these accessories to operate independently, but also uh, by enabling cache coherence between the accessory and the processor. And yeah, and in the paper, we evaluate actually different, uh, different versions of this interface with different characteristics. Different versions of memory. So we have an FPGA board with DDR4 versus HPM. So we look at the difference between HPM and DDR4. And we look at two workloads, as I mentioned. And in the end, this uh, boils down to how do you design the accelerator to take advantage of the uh, characteristics of the uh, workload? What should you offload? And how do you design the logic, which requires reading the paper clearly? But the results are, again, promising. Uh, that's what I want to show over here, really emphasize. Basically, Compared to a hefty IBM CPU, you get five to 27 X performance. Uh, and energy efficiency results are even better. You can see it's 12 to 133 X because you are really reducing the data moment. So this is interesting because of multiple reasons. One is clearly the numbers are quite large. You're taking advantage of the uh, two things here. You're taking advantage of the high bandwidth memory and also the customization capability of an FPGA you're fitting the workload to the FPGA as opposed to executing on this general purpose engine. And we basically take apart the benefits of each by comparing to DDR4, for example, over here. You can read the paper for more detail. But it's interesting to see that energy efficiency results are even higher, right, uh, than performance, uh, because th that's the effect of data moment, essentially, basically. You're not moving data as much. And also, you're making computations efficient by implementing on a, on a more efficient substrate, let's say. Even though the substrate cannot be clocked as high as uh, an IBM, CPU, you're getting both performance as well as energy efficiency. And the paper has comparisons between this high bandwidth memory and DDR4. And again, high bandwidth memory provides a lot more uh, performance. Okay. Is this interesting? Okay. I think the, uh, it's good to do this. Let's say, I, I think of these as demonstrations of a paradigm, let's say. Uh, clearly we have early on, we don't, we don't have these uh, real systems that we have access to. So we have to do things in simulation to demonstrate the paradigm. Uh, and over time, hopefully the work is having impact and people are building at least some versions of it. Uh, even though they may not be perfect with the envisioned versions, you can now use those versions, real systems to demonstrate uh, the benefits of the near memory computing paradigm, right? Hopefully going forward, we will see more of this. But I think I... Uh, I don't need to harp on it, but we really need to revisit the entire stack to enable things like this. And that's what this also uh, paper argues. Okay, so before uh, I think we finish, I want to talk about two things. One is how to enable adoption and then the real processing in memory systems. So even though this, uh, this system 
is kind of like near memory processing. And you could argue, yes, this is near memory processing. This is not as real as what we would like because this FPGA is still uh, not in the logic layer of the HPM, basically. It still has a more, let's say, traditional interface to memory. But it's just closer to memory clearly compared to the CPU. So we'll see more uh, real uh, processing in memory systems. Okay, before we do that, let's talk about adoption issues. And there are many adoption issues. And I think these works actually target some of those adoption issues. You can see that they, a lot of these works basically talk about applications and software, right? What benefits, what doesn't benefit? And I think that's really critical. When you investigate a new paradigm, you should really figure, focus on software and applications. Uh, and actually all, all four of these are mostly about software in the end. So ease of programming, how do you enable uh, uh, to program these more easily? What kind of interface do you provide? What kind of compiler and hardware support to enable programming again easily? How do you enable system and security support, coherence, synchronization, virtual memory, isolation of different applications, potentially sharing memory, uh, communication interfaces between memory and the processor? Some of these are very hairy, I think, like virtual memory, in my opinion, actually is very, at least the way it's designed today is not only very processor centric, but also it's just not scalable, basically. And we're seeing this today, I think. So I think going forward, we really need to reinvent virtual memory. And there are examples toward this direction, but I think there needs to be more effort put into this, really. It's, it's actually a very good idea, right? It was, it enabled, it's one of those ideas that, uh, it was perfect hardware software co-design idea that enabled many systems, but once systems start having huge amounts of memory, maybe virtual memory, the way we do it is not uh, very scalable. Again, uh, for example, I, uh, I, I like giving this example, uh, like uh, your YouTube, you're serving these huge videos and you're streaming the video into memory and doing something with it and then sending it, encoding, decoding. Does it really make sense to have virtual memory in that system, right? What you're dealing with is a huge file in the end. You can think of this as a blob, right? This is my video. This is the beginning, this is the end. And it gets into memory and I stream it. There's no translation involved here, right? I know exactly what I'm going to search for next. So think of it that way, basically. I think this sort of, uh, uh, it, and that's one of the reasons why I think uh, Google is designing these video decoding and encoding accelerators. And I believe that I have a lot of optimization in terms of eliminating virtual memory in those cases. But uh, yeah, taking advantage of these application characteristics to actually remove the need for translation uh, helps a lot, I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Potentially, but there's no perfect page size also, right? It's really application dependent. There are a lot of studies that look at page sizes. Some applications like the video example that I gave, right? They benefit from huge page sizes, actually large page sizes very nicely. Even then paging doesn't really uh, make sense in a sense because you have, let's say, I don't know, uh, I know 100 gigabyte video, right? Uh, today's largest pages are one gigabyte. Is that correct? We have four gigabyte pages today maybe two gigabytes, I don't know. Still those large pages. Large pages also cause a lot of issues actually. Yes, basically I think that uh, the, the, I think the real answer to your question is there's no perfect page size for applications. Some of them benefit from small, some of them benefit from large. And if you really want to design a virtual memory system that's efficient, you need to support all page sizes. And that actually makes it less efficient also because supporting a lot of page sizes is problematic because your uh, translation structures need to support those large page sizes also. Yeah, you can think about the TLBs, for example, page tables. Today, people use different page tables, different TLBs and different page tables to support those. Well, they can, they can, they actually have some combined TLBs, but they reduce the efficiency of the TLB. They cannot use all entries, for example, in the TLB. Yeah, it's basically a, a kind of a mess. <laughs> Maybe we need to think differently, basically. Maybe we need to think about data structures, right, as opposed to uh, page sizes. And that's, what, that's an argument we make in the virtual block interface uh, paper. Uh, that was one of the papers I think on the list, but we're not going to discuss it. Yes. 
my question was uh, why is it so uh, difficult to uh, manage with uh, different different page uh, sizes because in, uh, what I'm thinking of is uh, for example to uh, add some bits at the end uh, or uh, in the in the page entry let's say maybe uh, this page here is contiguous with the next uh, mm -hmm. two four eight uh, pages mm -hmm. so it, I, I don't see how this can be uh, so complicated to yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, you can do that. Uh, and people have proposed a lot of optimizations like that, but in the end, it adds more complexity to the system, right? Yeah. Yeah, basically, there are a lot of optimizations like what you proposed, uh, get proposed. They work when there's contiguity, for example. But then what do you, uh, one of the issues is what, what if you don't have contiguity, right? You, you need a one gigabyte page and you don't have one gigabyte contiguous region in your memory. What do you do? You're back to smaller pages potentially, or you defragment your memory, which is quite expensive also. Yeah, so there are a lot of issues, I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe encoding the page size is not the biggest issue, but getting actually these pages available to you maybe may become big. <laughs> okay, so good questions. So I think basically my point here is I think virtual memory needs to be rethought independently of uh, processing in memory as well. So even if you, you don't change the paradigm, maybe we should really be rethinking virtual memory. And I think there are some papers along that direction. I think that's true for coherence also, actually, as you have very large scale systems, does really uh, scaling the coherence also becomes a pro problem. And how do you get rid of the need for coherence becomes interesting. But of course, the, the, the problems change a little when you actually have processing near memory or processing in memory in general, because now you're communicating not between processors uh, that are maybe tightly connected to each other, but between processor and memory that are, let's say, more loosely connected with each other with, uh, with a narrow link. Okay, so there's more uh, data mapping, access and sharing control, scheduling, deciding what needs to be offloaded and not offloaded. So you need runtime and compilation systems and also ease the programmer's job in doing that. And finally, I think infrastructures to assess benefits of these systems is important because clearly there's always a need for simulation and those simulation infrastructures are being developed uh, and there are already existing ones. We have released several of them actually. Uh, and also infrastructures for, for real systems is also important. So I think uh, there are clearly a lot of barriers over here, but maybe the biggest barrier is really the mindset barrier but maybe we're overcoming that also, given that some big companies are actually right now implementing processing near memory engines. So for example, one of the barriers of mindset was, oh, this is too costly, right? I think we're seeing that that is reducing a little bit because even the most cost sensitive companies like Samsung and Hynix have implemented processing uh, near memory engines. And some of them are actually uh, quite sophisticated. Uh, maybe not as sophisticated as we would like, but still sophisticated from a perspective of an industry uh, person, especially who, who, uh, who has been working in those companies that are extremely cost sensitive. <laughs> okay, so, okay, I think this is kind of obvious also. So there are many interesting uh, issues. Again, we don't have, I don't want to keep, finish this lecture on time. How do you keep it simple is also important. So this, uh, uh, again, a relatively old paper that we wrote on PIM enabled instructions. SIMDM actually implements a version of this. The idea is, uh, to encode processing in memory operations as instructions uh, in the ISA. And this can be offloaded or not offloaded, depending on uh, uh, the trade-offs of offloading versus not offloading. And I think this is uh, still a nice idea. How do you maintain coherence? This is actually very interesting and thorny, not as bad as virtual memory, I think. And we have some work related to that. This is actually more general, uh, it's, it's basically, for near data accelerators, but it could be used even more generally as well, general accelerators. Uh, I don't want to talk about the details of it, but this is a motivational slide that shows that uh, if you partition your work in an application between CPU and processing near memory, and if you implement a traditional coherence mechanism, the performance doesn't improve that much, or you lose performance actually, on average, significant loss, like 25% in this case. These are small data sets, that's why the numbers are small. But if you actually go to large data sets, which are longer, much longer to simulate, the numbers become much larger. Uh, so basically, coherence matters a lot. Uh, when you partition your applications 
if you actually have a not so good coherence mechanism or existing coherence mechanism, it doesn't work very well. So uh, this paper shows that an ideal coherence mechanism actually buys a lot of performance, even in these small scale applications. And it proposed a technique that gets at least somewhat close to that ideal performance. And the idea is basically, you don't want to communicate coherence messages for every uh, operation that you do, right? For example, if processing in memory engine is going to read or write a location. If it has to communicate with a, a coherence mechanism that's on the CPU, it has to go through the bus, right? And vice versa. Uh, well, depends on where the coherence mechanism is uh, located, but if you're executing on the, uh, on the memory side, uh, if the coherence mechanism is on the processor side, you do a lot of communication whenever you need to read or write. And the idea here is, in this lazy PIM, is to don't communicate uh, everything at a fine grain level, uh, but uh, keep track of what addresses you've accessed on the memory side as well as the CPU side. And the memory side, when the memory side function ends, compare those addresses, see if there's any overlap, meaning if there are any conflicts. And if there is no conflict between what the CPU did and the memory did, then say that, okay, there is no coherence problem, basically. That's the idea. This is more uh, an example of bulk execution. You basically check coherence in bulk as opposed to uh, every single load and store. And that buys you a lot of performance, as you can see, and also energy efficiency. And the paper has results with large data sets, uh, which show even higher performance and energy benefits. Okay, synchronization is also interesting. What kind of synchronization primitives do you support? How do you support them? Again, I don't have time. You can read or watch the paper. And this paper tackles a virtual memory issue. But again, I think the solution in this paper is uh, limited. Uh, and the idea is actually nice and simple, but it's limited in the sense that uh, this basically says, uh, assign a portion of your virtual memory to your near data engine and use it only, right? Clearly this is not necessarily desirable, right? Okay, so uh, any questions on this? But these are actually very interesting uh, research issues, actually. So uh, processing in memory in the real world, this is something that has been happening only for two or three years, let's say. And I mentioned this upmem processing in DRAM engine. Uh, essentially, this is the first commercial engine uh, processing in memory engine that we know of. Well, if it's commercial, I guess we should have known of it before. So I think uh, this is the first commercial engine. Uh, and essentially, this is processing near memory. Uh, okay, these are real DIMMs and these are real systems, as you can see. And you can uh, re uh, take a look at this archive paper that actually covers a lot of detail uh, and a lot of information and benchmarking of the system. I will mention that also. But if you look at the system, uh, this is a near bank processing system. So you have a bank and you have an instruction memory and you have a, let's say, working memory, WRAM. It's a programmer managed scratch pad memory, essentially. And then you can basically load instructions as well as data. And then you do the processing in the CPU. So this is why this is processing in memory. You don't, you still have memory and processor, except memory and processor are very close to each other, right? And it's just a bank of memory you have. So there are some limitations of the system also, as you can see. You, this, this processor has access to only this bank and no other bank. If it needs to access some other bank, it needs to go through the CPU basically. That's somewhat of a poor uh, initial, uh, maybe design choice, but to get it working, that may be a good design choice. Uh, to get it into the market. But this basically limits the set of workloads uh, that you can really take advantage of this for. Because if you can parallelize your workloads nicely and if you have a data moment bottleneck, this works greatly. But if there's a lot of communication that you need across different processors and different banks and different chips, then you have a problem. And you can read more about this. You can watch lectures that uh, we have given. This is Juan giving a lecture. And you can read this paper if you're interested. That covers a lot. Uh, and this is a shorter version of that paper if you're interested. Yeah, much shorter. <laughs> and I think to enable adoption of these systems, it's always important to develop benchmarks and workloads to see these are workloads where the system not necessarily performs very well. In some of these workloads, it performs extremely well, actually. In some of these workloads, it performs terrible. But uh, we basically developed this uh, workload suite uh, where the system uh, can be tested and people. Uh, Hopefully people will be adding to this workload suite and you can find that online. So it's, I think it's, it's very nice that these things exist right now. Yes, please. Uh, 
Yeah, it's not automatic. Yeah, basically the programmer needs to specify what needs to be offloaded. They need to orchestrate the data communication. So the program is involved a lot actually in this case. Okay. Uh, do you think there would ever be a, a PI module that would essentially replace or could be used as a replacement of the RAM in our uh, systems and could also be programmer blind? I see. Yeah, that would be nice, I think, certainly. <laughs> uh, I mean, po it's possible, right? Uh, it's possible, but I don't think we're there yet in terms of the software infrastructure, compiler infrastructure, for example, or even the operating system infrastructure. How do you schedule uh, tasks, right? If it's an accelerator as well as memory at the same time, how do you deal with that? So I think there are a lot of issues to enable like seamless adoption. I think in what you said, there are two orthogonal things. One is it's seamless, uh, the programmer doesn't specify anything, let's say. And the second thing is, how do you use the memory as both memory as well as accelerator? I think there are different research issues over there. I don't think we're there yet, but I think these are good steps to hopefully get there at some point. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so you can read more about the upman PIM system in these uh, papers I mentioned. And we've already talked about another real demonstration, but uh, of processing near memory. Uh, there are also other works. Uh, this is not uh, from a real system, but this is a methodology that enables us to uh, decide when to offload, what function to offload. I think this is actually important. These are more infrastructure to enable uh, the programmer to decide better, let's say. So clearly there are a lot of demonstrations of near data processing on many workloads. I think there are dot, dot, dot. We covered more than what is stated on this picture, actually. The question is, when do you actually uh, like what function do you offload? So in this case, uh, in this work, we did a comprehensive study of more than 300 applications. You can see some of them over here. The paper has a complete list. And we tried to ask the question, can we identify the bottlenecks through application profiling? We don't want to automate it yet. Well, we, before you automate, you need to really understand and develop insight clearly. Uh, and the idea is basically uh, by looking at simple metrics, and I'm not going to go through this metric. Some of these are arithmetic intensity, uh, Mrs. Percular instruction, and last to first miss ratio. Basically, this, these, these look at locality, for example. Uh, actually, all of them have some component of locality, but arithmetic intensity is also about computation. Uh, and basically, looking at these metrics, you can classify any function to a memory bottleneck class. Of course, you need to somehow, let's say, uh, learn uh, and uh, decide some thresholds based on these metrics. Uh, and this is a quite accurate classification. These memory bottleneck classes are a quite good predictor of whether uh, offloading to a processing near memory engine would provide benefits for that function. That's the idea basically, that's the goal, right? Can you look at simple metrics to decide whether you can offload, whether you should offload uh, to a processing near memory engine? It's not automated, so it still requires work from the person who is trying to answer that question, but uh, I think it provides a lot of insight into what should be offloaded and what should not be. And you can see workloads are bottlenecked by different things, DRAM bandwidth, DRAM latency, L1 and L2 capacity, L3 contention, L3 capacity, and some of them are compute bound and it definitely doesn't make sense to offload these ones. Okay, so again, you can look at it online. Uh, all of this is open source, even the simulator is open source, as you can see, and there are uh, seminars that describe this. Okay, and more recently, as we also mentioned, uh, this is 2021, Samsung implemented this processing in memory architecture uh, that they basically specifically posed for machine learning essentially. Uh, and this has some similarities to uh, the Upmam engine actually, even though it's based on a different technology, high bandwidth memory too. Uh, basically they're good at doing multiply, accumulate and multiply and add operations for a good reason, right? They're targeting machine learning specifically. And you can see this is the programmable computing block that they add near bank and they have floating point operations. This is something Upmem doesn't have, for example. Upmem is really not targeted for machine learning, for example. It's really targeted for other applications. Whereas here, the target mainly is machine learning. And you can see uh, they can do floating point also. So that probably occupies a lot of space uh, in their DRAM process. Uh, so this is what I mean by uh, what people would say no <laughs> vehemently in the past to some of the things to be done in DRAM, they're saying yesterday and they're actually implementing chips uh, 
So that's how things have evolved. Like 10 years ago, if you actually asked them to put floating points, they would probably say, get out of here. And I have that experience actually. I mean, they don't say get out of here to me, but uh, you, can, you can tell the, from the body language, right? Uh, how, uh, how blasphemous it is to uh, suggest something like that. But yeah, you can see this is the instructions that are available uh, to execute. And according to them, basically, they don't need to change the software. I don't know since we haven't looked at it, but this is their claim. You can have a Python-based machine learning system and you don't need to change software. They somehow seamlessly offload, but yeah, I'm curious about that. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, if, you can, if you look at this, basically uh, two banks share processing elements over here. So they can get two different operands from two different banks here. Data mapping becomes a problem here also. So basically a lot of issues that we kind of had in the adoption issues also apply, even though this is a very restricted system that can just do machine learning. Right? And if you're interested, there's this paper that talks about it. This is an ISSCC, very short two-page two paper where they demonstrate the system. But there's also another paper at ISCA that looks at the performance of the system. Okay. And then uh, there are other processing in memory modules. This is uh, another one from Samsung and Facebook together. They basically designed this deep learning recommendation system. And again, I don't, I'm not going to go into any detail here, but you can read this another paper written on this topic. This is a bit different because you can see that this is a DRAM module. Well, this is a module and there are a lot of DRAM chips on it. And then there's a buffer chip over here, which is essentially aggregating data and doing processing on the data over here. So everything put together on a single module, basically. It's an accelerator card for deep learning recommendations. You can read the paper for more detail. I think this is also interesting, certainly. Uh, I, I can see the reasons why they did it. They need to access a lot of data and maybe they really cannot partition the data, for example, nicely over here. So they need to aggregate the data and do operations on them. Uh, that's why this buffer makes sense. And this buffer is clearly not on the other side of the card. So clearly there's some communication overhead over here because it's not near bank, but it could benefit that application where you do need to do a lot of ag aggregation, right? And you can read the paper, as I said. And this is more recent. This is a few weeks ago, February 16, you can see the announcement over here. And Hynix, uh, which is a second major DRAM manufacturer, uh, implemented another DRAM chip uh, that can do accelerator in memory, according to them. Uh, I don't have a lot of detail in these slides, but this seems uh, even more capable than the Samsung uh, chip in the sense that uh, it's not just targeted towards machine learning, even though they talk about AI, but they also say uh, other applications can benefit. So. They also have actually some limited row clone type capability in this chip. They describe it in their ISSCC slides. Uh, it's not exactly what we envisioned, of course. It's not the most aggressive forms, but they can, they can basically copy data from one bank to another bank using limited interconnection mechanisms, not as aggressively as row clone described. So it's good that these ideas are kind of creeping into the space, right? Maybe over time, full-blown row clone will be there, right? Okay, I think uh, this is a play, probably a good place to end. What do you think? Because we're almost at the end of the presentation. I've covered what I really needed to uh, cover. Any questions, any burning questions? What should we do next week? <laughs> Not more of this because I think I'm done with this. <laughs> or we could do another topic like, if you <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, any other topic suggestions? Yes. Virtual memory topic. Okay. Yeah, maybe. What else? Okay. Security, hardware security exploits, row hammer plus other things. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Huh. Like in general. Like. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly works on that direction, but a lot of the papers are actually still processing in memory related, but using uh, other technologies like RAM, resistor RAM, which can do matrix vector multiplication more seamlessly. But that's another possibility. Any other thoughts or ideas? What about genome analysis? Is that interesting? Okay, what do they say? 
Okay. Okay, I see. Good scientific presentation or good presentation in this course? Actually, there's some, there's a very good correlation, but I think of scientific presentation as not evaluating a paper, but presenting a paper. That's the difference, I think. Otherwise, a lot of the principles apply, I think. We kind of talked about what makes a good presentation, right? Uh, in one of, the, in the first lecture, but certainly we can talk more about that. Any other thoughts? This is your chance to potentially influence the direction because I see a lot of different directions, which is good. Okay, I see. Uh, beyond what you have on YouTube that you can watch. Okay, <laughs> I mean, for sure, we are happy to do that also, but if you think it's beneficial beyond what you have, like you may ask questions, yeah. But I would, uh, I would strongly recommend people to watch it. And if you think something is needed beyond that, we can we certainly have, I think, three weeks right now, right? Or maybe two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. And then the third week is the first presentation starts. So two weeks. And we can use one of those weeks to discuss that, certainly. Or give an example presentation. OK, if there's nothing else, I will see you next week. Take care.